Hey, mate, Luke Ford here. My guest today is philosopher Nathan Kofnes. Uh, Nathan, in the United States, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Israeli versus Hamas conflict is just dominating the news since October 7. Is it the same way in the United Kingdom? I don't know. I, I rarely leave my apartment, so. Um, but I believe so. Uh, and I've heard of protests in London and, uh, and elsewhere. But I assume people are talking about it. Why do you think there's so much interest in this this war? Like, it doesn't seem to have, there doesn't seem to be immediate rational empirical reasons for people in the United Kingdom or the United States uh, to, to have this as their number one story. Where do you think things that Israel does when Israel go to war so dominate the news? Well, and the existence of Israel is regarded as a tremendous insult to by much of the Muslim world. Um, not something that, um, I mean, when Muslims kill each other frequently on a much, much, much larger scale than anything Israel has even allegedly done to uh, the Palestinians, but that doesn't really trigger people's uh, you know, tribal instincts in the same way as when a Jew, you know, stops somebody at a checkpoint and inconveniences him, or, or worse. Um, so, and Israel, the Jews and Israel have come to represent in among the left, non-Muslims, Israel, the epitome of whiteness and privilege and ongoing uh, colonialism. So from an ideological perspective, it makes sense that there'll be a, uh, a focus on this conflict. And objectively, this has the potential to affect the world in a way that other conflicts don't. Uh, if this theoretically in a worst case scenario, it can draw in Lebanon and Iran and for whatever it's worth, uh, Russia would be supporting, uh, would, would side with Iran and, and the Palestinians. Theoretically, China could uh, not, I'm sure they're not gonna want, they're not gonna seek out a direct conflict, but they could be somehow involved. You, you can see in how this could uh, become basically a, a world war. So from that perspective, people have a reason to be concerned about what's happening. And why has this conflict seized your public attention over the last three weeks? Well, for those reasons. Uh, uh, and also Israel uh, serves a similar psychological function that uh, anti-Semitism used to serve. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that anti-Semitism is as simple as this. There are many other, other reasons for anti-Semitism, but one of them is uh, people, li people need scapegoats. Uh, that's what unites people that's a way for political figures to rally support, uh, get everybody behind a cause. And uh, now, at least in the West, for the time being, it's politically correct to use Jews, qua Jews, for that function. Uh, so you need a substitute. And, uh, the substitute for, in many ways, is Israel. I pointed out recently that the number uh, two-thirds of the uh, uh, 
resolutions condemning countries in the General Assembly in the United Nations are targeting Israel. I mean, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Even if you said Israel is guilty of everything that has been accused of, which it's not, but even if you would say that, it still doesn't make any sense that Israel would be the subject of such intense focus uh, by much of the world. And uh, I think a large part of the explanation for that is Israel is the Jew among the nations. And so would you regard this fascination with Jews and, and the Jewish state and often widespread antipathy to Jews and the Jewish state, would you regard this as primarily springing out of conflict of interests? Would you regard this as primarily something that's irrational? How, how would you understand the basis for this fascination and antipathy? Well, how to define interests is a difficult uh, problem because acting, I mean, is it in my interest to act on my irrational impulses? Well, all of our desires are ultimately irrational. There's no rational basis for any ultimate end that we have. So if somebody has a desire to kill all the Jews because that makes them feel good, then we disagree, or, or most of us disagree with that. Um, but our disagreement is also, in a sense, irrational. We, we want Jews to live. They want Jews to die. And uh, uh, we prefer our way of seeing things, and we oppose people on the other side. But classifying their, their goals as irrational is maybe, maybe questionable. You can be irrational with respect to your means to achieve the goals. So if you think that you're going to make yourself richer or more organized or more successful by killing Jews or getting rid of Israel, then yeah, that's wrong. That's objectively wrong. Um, even if you kill all the, all the Jews in the world and all the Israelis, um, that's not going to benefit very many. Many of the people who would wish for that to happen will not actually experience the benefits that they they uh, expect. So in that sense, they're they're objectively irrational and could be criticized. But those who just want to win in the tribal war, then that's just their that's just their feelings. Now, is there anything about this uh, conflict and reactions to it, Israel versus Hamas? Israel going to war in Gaza, Hamas carrying out a brutal attack, killing over 1,400 Israelis on October 7th. Uh, anything about this, this conflict and the discussion of it that has most surprised you, most taken you aback? I was surprised by the support that Israel has received in, uh, in the Democrat establishment, although this is obviously being driven by the octogenarian class or septuagenarian class. Uh, if the democratic establishment were under the control of Zoomers, then it would not, have, it would not be like this. But I think somebody like Biden probably sincerely cares about, about Jews and has a, a memory of of the Holocaust, which doesn't really exist uh, among the Zoomer liberal generation. Um, you know, they, like look at the, uh, the video of Jews cowering in the library of, um, what was that school in New York? Uh, uh, NYU, New York University. No, it, it, was, it was the, uh, isn't it the, the performing arts school, the Cooper Union or something? Uh, okay. I thought it was, anyway, whatever it was. Um, now to a lot of, 
to the to boomers, that's shocking. Like, oh, Jews uh, hiding in a room while while a mob bangs on the door because they remember they have some memory of pogroms and the Holocaust. But to the, to young liberals, it doesn't. They don't have those associations. It's just white people. Who cares? Now those same boomers who care that it, that it's Jews who are hiding in the in the room from the mob, they wouldn't care if they were white people, even if they were Jews, but they were being identified as white. It wouldn't bother them. So the young generation of liberals sees Jews the same way that boomers see all white people, um, which for boomers is shocking, but not, uh, but not for uh, the new liberals. Now, would you say that uh, universities either in America or United Kingdom, to the best of your knowledge, are they particularly dangerous places for Jews? I'm particularly dangerous. No, no. I mean, not by historical standards. Uh, and I mean, if danger is defined as you know microaggressions, then then yeah. But I mean, if you if you walk through a, a pro Hamas rally and without making it clear that you're you're in favor of Hamas, then maybe you could get shoved on a campus. It's as far as physical threats go, I think it's not likely to go beyond that for the in the immediate future. Um, but there will the uh, the pro Palestinian faction will try to will accelerate the purge of Jews from institutions like universities. So there'll be more discrimination against Jews. Although we do have this, this group of people that, who are generally of older generations who are trying to push back uh, against the anti-Israel, Israelism and, and which often borders on anti-Semitism, but they are not the future of the party. So uh, I don't think that their influence is going to last for very much longer. Now, discrimination against Jews in academia, how, how, how severe or how intense is this? So Eric Kaufman published some data on this recently in surveys of faculty um, at elite universities, it used to be, I think, 20% Jewish. Uh, it's 20% it's Jewish among um, faculty who are older than 60 years old. And now it's around 5% Jewish for faculty under 30. Um, so part of that is due to the fact that we're competing against Asians who are very high performers, obviously. So that's not all discrimination. And there are probably a lot fewer full-blooded Jews. I think that there definitely are a lot fewer uh, full-blooded Jews than there used to be. But uh, the drop, seems to have occur occurred much faster can, than could be explained by those factors. So, uh, I mean, it's clearly um, applying for jobs as a Jewish academic in 2023 is very different from doing it in 1983 or 1993. Uh, you're white, white being white is bad and being Jewish is just makes it slightly worse. Now, what about being, you know, highly self-identifying as a, a Jew, 
there's like an ethnic and, and a religious element to that, I would think that that would largely go against uh, university norms, at least for certain groups. It's it's kind of frowned upon to have an intense in-group identity, particularly on university campuses. Anything to that? Well, if it's um, presented as a religious identity, uh, I don't think people will have a have a problem with that per se. And there are very few people who are um, like there used to be Jews, uh, especially German Jews, who thought German Jews are the best, and it was very much a racial thing. Uh, no one would get away with that nowadays. Uh, or if, if somebody were said that Jews are, they're proud to be ethnically Jewish. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that would go down very well at universities. Now, Israel is in part an ethnicity-based state, not, not in the sense of many fevered imaginations that it's some kind of pure ethno state, but uh, anyone who's Jewish has, has the right to, to move there. It is the, the Jewish state. One would think that this would just inherently rub leftists uh, the wrong way, because to be on the left, th does that not mean to have disdain for ethnic-based communities and states? Well, the, uh, the liberal attitude toward Israel or in any particular situation is informed by many conflicting principles and interpretations of history and that influence how they should apply those principles. And if there were a, a, a white Gentile group that had been a beleaguered minority for centuries and had been subject to uh, persecutions uh, culminating in an attempted extermination and, um, and, and that they then tried to go back to their historic homeland that they had left a long time ago. Um, that would be perceived very differently by the left than if you know the British just tried to set up a new colony in South America or Africa. Um, it so happens that there's only one example of a people doing something like what the Jews uh, what the Jews did and who have that kind of experience. So. And it's not, um, from a liberal perspective, I don't think it's, uh, it's not immediately obvious what their position should or shouldn't be, uh, but the idea that there should be a place of refuge for this uh, population, I think could be squared with the mainstream liberal worldview. Now, as a matter of fact, Israel is a multi-ethnic country, as people who have been there know. Uh, you can come if you're just a quarter Jewish, and you can bring your family who is not Jewish at all. You're not a completely non-Jewish spouse. They, there are ways of immigrating, even if you're not Jewish at all. They've given Jewish status to large groups of people who um, whose halachic status as Jews is somewhat debatable and who have no genetic connection to other Jewish populations. Um, so, you know, if Israel said we're only letting in full-blooded Jews of certain ethnicities, then I don't think that would be accepted by the left. 
but the current policy, I think, from a leftist perspective, could be considered um, uh, defensible. Uh, would it be fair to say that the creation of the modern state of Israel was carried out with a substantial amount of ethnic cleansing, that uh, the founders of the modern state of Israel did not see it as in their best interest to have uh, plenty of you know, Arab Muslims in, in their midst? So would that be a fair description of much of what happened in 1947-48? I mean, certainly that occurred. I, there were people who created incentives or, or moved Arabs around. Um, so you could call it. So yeah, I guess you could consider that uh, ethnic cleansing. Although I would, have, uh, it's interesting that people only care about. There, there are many people who are moved around before and immediately after World War II, inter including hundreds of thousands of Jews from Arab countries. Um, and no one, or many of the people who talk a lot about uh, the Palestinians being expelled from uh, land that was claimed for the, uh, the Jewish state don't seem to know about or care about any of the other examples of something similar happening, including to Jews. So that would be kind of curious um, uh, phenomenon that should be explained. So there, there are many Jewish groups and much public Jewish discussion about what's in the best interests of Jews, very hard-headed discussion of uh, birth rates and you know, the relative uh, ratio of Jews to non-Jews in, in the Jewish state, uh, this would be considered, uh, I mean, highly problematic if it was conducted by Europeans discussing, say, birth rates of Europeans versus non-Europeans in various European states. Is that fair? Well, yeah, of course. But so there's a double standard, but there's also a reason for the double standard. Like, you know, having consistent principles doesn't mean that you deliver the same judgment with respect to every case. It, you look at each case and and see what how the principles apply. And, and the, the Jewish experience has been very different from the experience of, say, uh, the British, and that is one of the reasons that Israel is viewed differently from uh, from the UK, where Jews, when Jews say we need a country in order to prevent people from killing us, there's a reason people take that argument more seriously than when uh, the British National Party said it. Because people don't have experience with British people being a minority and being killed. So um, people don't have the imagination to think that maybe, maybe the same protections that Jews are asking for and which they recognize are required by Jews could uh, at some point be necessary for for Brits. So maybe we would argue that that's a failure of imagination on their part, but there is a logic to their to that view. We know that Jews need it. We have no evidence that uh, that Brits need it. So therefore we we allow Jews to take these measures, but we don't allow uh, Brits to. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with that. I'm just saying that's the logic, which I, I think has a certain kind of coherence to it. And extending that logic uh, would, would be perhaps to say that you can only understand the, the massacre carried out October 7th by understanding the 
historical experience of people living in Gaza, that it's akin to living in an open air prison and with, with a hostile you know, foreign nation controlling uh, much of what goes on in, in Gaza. Therefore, while it's universally revolting, considered revolting to, to massacre civilians the way that uh, Hamas did on October 7, this occurred in a particular context of an oppressed people lashing out at their oppressors. Would that be a legitimate and fair extrapolation on what you were just talking about? So, I mean, that explains the logic of that of that position. And this is an, um, just an application of the, the general anti-white position, which is that the, the bad circumstances of non-white or people who are perceived as non-white is due to some white oppressor. And uh, therefore, they always have a right to lash out at whatever who, the whites that are in the vicinity because they're by definition the oppressors and they have to de decolonize them. So, uh, yeah, that's the, but I think a more, um, a more reasonable um, story about the context would include how we got to this situation in the first place, the total unwillingness of Arabs to accept a Jewish state leading to wars in which Israel acquired uh, territory and then faced uh, continued Arab refusal to accept their existence and Arabs electing Hamas, although that was in whatever it was, 2006, 2007, and uh, there haven't been elections since, but still that's part of the context is that they elected Hamas, although this was always Hamas's position that they would refuse to recognize Israel. And uh, that they also had many opportunities to improve their condition uh, right, I saw Alan Dershowitz recently suggested that Gaza could have become like Singapore, which I think is an exaggeration. But there are you know, Arab countries that, that are doing fine. And I think that if uh, the Gazans had decided to give up on terrorism and rein in the uh, those who um, who insisted on fighting Israel to the death, they would have been flooded with donations and uh, many countries establishing relations with them. Israel would uh, would cooperate with them. Uh, they, it's not impossible that they could have become something like uh, Dubai. Uh, but they, that's, they didn't choose that. They chose, um, if you look at surveys of, of Gazans, that's a, it's arguably a minority that support uh, uh, terrorism. Although I've seen surveys that, with different numbers, but there's a, just a huge percent percentage of Gazans who say that they want war with Israel right now. So you can't have the, the inevitable consequence of that is that Israel will respond and make life miserable for everybody. So that's just, it's their responsibility to collectively figure out if, if that's the route they want to take or if they want to take a different route and then they have to get the uh, get that under control and stop forcing Israel to respond to them in a way that then they complain about.
So at Harvard University, a coalition of more than 30 student groups posted an open letter on the night of the Hamas attack saying that Israel was entirely responsible for the violence that ended up killing more than 1,400 people, most of them civilians. Uh, What's your reaction to this? So I saw some commentators were saying, like, oh, look at what people are learning in college. Look what we teach our college students. But this has nothing to do with what's taught in college. This is about college and graduate school admissions. This is who they admit. There are people who would not have signed those letters who are more qualified than the people who did sign the letters, than the the median uh, person who who signed the letters. Um, I mean, a lot of the signatories come from uh, groups that uh, benefit strongly from affirmative action. So they rejected conservative whites and Jews uh, who, um, who would have been on the other side of these this issue, and they accepted people who are pro Hamas. So, uh, the people like Larry Summers who are confused: Why did this happen? Why, why did Harvard um, end up in this place? Nobody expected. Because you brought all these people on campus. I couldn't go to Harvard. I was repeated. I was rejected from Harvard over and over again. Um, now, if, if when Larry Summers could have accepted me, he, they could have accepted uh, someone like me. A lot of people with my views, then there would be uh, they wouldn't have this monoculture that they are now surprised about and complain about. So I, I had a, a different reaction. To, to this story, and I looked at my own heart. I, I have never lost sleep over Palestinian suffering, and Palestinians have suffered terribly. It's just that because my group is in an intense, ongoing conflict with, with Palestinians, I tend to just save most of my emotional energy for, for my group, but there's nothing in me that uh, denies the, the large amount of, of Palestinian suffering. So I kind of expect people just to side with their own team. So I don't think these student groups really were uh, celebrating the murder of innocent people. I think they were just instinctively siding with their team. So is instinctively siding with your team, isn't this pretty much the rule in the human condition? And we we all tend to have either hero systems or ethnic or, or religious uh, national loyalties, and we don't, you know, we're not even capable of looking at them objectively, and we just instinctively side with with a team. And isn't this uh, 30 student groups at uh, Harvard signing a petition blaming the, the violence entirely on Israel, isn't this just an inherent and, and normal part of the human condition, which on the one hand sounds absolutely barbaric, Uh, On the other hand, there's probably some evolutionary advantage in just instinctively siding with your group. Well, people choose what group, what group to identify with. This isn't just along racial lines. I I mean, why does the LGBT group at Harvard, why would they side with Hamas? They would literally get thrown off a building. How is that their team or their group? Um, I think the the Nepali Student Association, I think maybe their representative said they they signed it without reading it, uh, which is whatever. Uh, But why would they be on Hamas's side or the Arab side? Um, I think that this, uh, and even Jewish groups, there are Jewish groups at Harvard that have also cited, although who knows? Uh, I mean, so, so many Jews now are a quarter Jewish. Um, I, I'm even in my memory, uh, I, I, 
when I was a kid, there, there were a lot of Jews who were half Jews. Their father was Jewish. They identified as Jews. Now it's a quarter Jewish and they're still identifying as Jewish. I don't know if it's going to last even another generation, the one eighth Jews. Uh, um, I think a lot of them, I think a big issue is stereotyping Israel as white. So it's white versus slightly less white. Therefore, white is wrong. Uh, and, and then combined with that, Israel serves this, this function of being um, the country that everyone can agree is bad, everyone can blame for their uh, for for various problems. So, so the the kind of the coalition of the unhappy people kind of find it natural to um, to be against Israel, even if uh, they would. They would be much better off in Tel Aviv than uh, much more welcome if they went to Tel Aviv than Gaza City. And what do you think of these billionaires who want to know the names of these students so that they never hire them? And also there's been a truck that's been circling around Harvard with, with the names and photos of students who signed the petition. This is called doxing, but they're not putting the students' addresses. So I don't think it's really a matter of doxing, but uh, the, the retaliation for signing on to this kind of statement, is this uh, cancel culture? What do you think? I, so the, the billionaires who are behind the, the, uh, the complaints, and they're mostly, as far as I know, all of them are boomers. So again, it suggests that the re resistance is coming from that generation and uh, uh, pretty soon there's gonna be a large shift away from uh, any kind of pro-Israel attitudes on the left. But is it cancel culture? I, I don't know, I mean, cancel culture is not really precisely defined uh, I, my feeling about it is the left has used their power to expel everyone, basically everybody that they don't like from elite institutions while denying that there's any discrimination, any cancel culture. And now one time, a few liberals are criticized or even lost, a, one Harvard student lost a job and, uh, um, and uh, then Michael Eisen was removed from his position as editor uh, of a journal, which isn't a real job anyway. Um, and now they're crying that, about the new McCarthyism. I and how how devastated should I be about this possible infringement of free speech, given that the left has has just purged all conservatives, there are basically no conservatives that can be hired now at many institutions, unless they're willing to lie and completely misrepresent their views. Um, yeah, I, I don't see that as, uh, as the main issue. And say, so how would you compare what happened to Michael Eisen being removed as the editor of a journal to what happened to Noah Carl, who I, I believe lost his Cambridge scholarship over politically incorrect, uh, perhaps uh, somewhat race-based uh, essays that he'd published? So Noah Carl lost an actual job. Like he was employed by St. Edmund's College, Cambridge. And they told him, 
like your car doesn't work anymore. You have to leave. Uh, Michael Eisen is a tenured professor at Berkeley. There's no suggestion that is his job. There's no suggestion whatsoever that that job is in jeopardy. So his position was editor of the journal. Now, uh, jobs, all jobs come with restrictions on your free speech. That's all jobs. Uh, it's my First Amendment right to go write on Twitter that my bad things about my students and call them names and, and whatever. But I'm not allowed to do that. And I shouldn't be allowed to do that uh, because my job is to respect my students. Um, so the job of journal editor also comes with restrictions on speech. You have to the, the job of the journal editor is to be impartial and make people feel confident that he's going to treat them fairly. And that may not be consistent with all social media activity that would otherwise be protected by the First Amendment. So this is a, this is a very much a gray area. And it's also important to note that the right-wing version of Michael Eisen would never have been a journal editor in the first place. He would never be out. Maybe he could have been hired 30, 40 years ago, but certainly not in the last 10, 20 years at Berkeley. Um, and as I uh, pointed out yesterday, in 2019, there was a search for a professor, assistant professor in the life sciences at Berkeley, which is where Michael Eisen works. And the first round of cuts to the applicants, applicant pool was made based on their diversity statement. And the university published, human resources published the, uh, the, the guidelines for scoring diversity statements. So if you say that you treat everyone equally or whatever, then you fail. You, you get uh, the lowest mark possible on your diversity statement. And uh, I mean, in order to get a, a sufficiently high mark, I mean, you have to go all out about how diverse your whole life is and your research and everything is all about diversity and equity. So just a, a, a loyalty oath to wokeism, that's far more extreme and then the infamous loyalty oaths uh, in the McCarthy era, where you, you said that you're not a member of any organization that seeks to violently overthrow the, the US government, including the Communist Party, which they'd want to violently overthrow the US government. So those were the, the terrible McCarthy era oaths that we're always hearing about, how bad that was. But now it's much, much worse. Um, now, 76% of the applicants for that job were automatically disqualified because of their political views on wokeism. They failed the, the diversity statement. Michael Eisen didn't say anything about that. None of his free, free speech defenders said anything about that. Nobody cared. Uh, now, in that case, that was clearly a violation of free speech and academic freedom. I mean, the, your views on equity and diversity have absolutely nothing to do with your research in the life sciences. And they're not relevant to doing your job, uh, which is to treat people equally, which is exactly what they, what they said you, would be a failing answer for the diversity statement. So that's just a way of weeding out people with political views that they don't like. Now, if you're a journal editor, should you go around insulting large groups of people and being very inf politically inflammatory, saying, uh, using profanity with regard to certain countries where many authors that would submit to your journal live? Should you be doing that? That's very questionable. Um, 
and the uh, uh, the statement released by the journal, the journal's publisher said that they were firing Michael Eisen because of a series of a pattern of behavior on social media. So it wasn't just one tweet where he retweeted the Onion article. Uh, but he's generally been very unprofessional on social media, and I can understand why that would be a an issue and for his ability to perform his his duties associated with that job. Now, the main petition that uh, objects to the firing of Michael Eisen says that it would be appropriate to file the journal editor if he was racist, if he engaged in hate speech. The, so these are Michael Eisen's defenders. In other words, you could fire Michael Eisen if he were a conservative, because mainstream conservative conservatism is associated with views that liberals consider hate speech. So no, all conservatives, basically all conservatives will uh, be considered purveyors of hate speech by Michael Eisen's defenders. So they, they want to keep their guy and fire everybody else. So this, from their perspective, this has nothing to do with free speech at all. So th these, these are shocking uh, events uh, beginning on October 7, and now we're, we're getting close to 10,000 Palestinians dead. And yet my worldview hasn't changed one millimeter. Uh, these shocking events just confirm my worldview. I assume that these shocking events just confirm your worldview. And it sure seems when I look around and watch and listen and read pundits that uh, these shocking events just confirm everybody's worldview. Do, do many, am I right that uh, these events have only confirmed your worldview? And two, why is it that we have shocking events and they don't seem to change many people's worldview? Well, as I mentioned, I was surprised by some of the support that Israel has received. So I did have to make some, some adjustments. To, and I was also, like everybody, I was surprised by the uh, the performance of Shin Bet and Mossad and the IDF, and that was really confusing. Um, I'm not. I'm still not sure what to how to interpret that that failure uh, and understand what it means. There's a certain, some of these events have made me rethink some things, but we already knew that the left was on the side of um, the Palestinians and that they were in principle open to violence against uh, in the service of decolonization. So uh, as far as that goes, I don't think there was much to be surprised about. Are you a Zionist? I mean, my understanding of Zionism is that it's the ideology that calls for Jews all over the world to, um, to gather in Israel, and I, I live in Cambridge and in Seoul. So it seems to me that that disqualifies me from being a Zionist. And I, I married a non-Jewish woman. I, mean, I think Jewish continuity and contributing to Jewish continuity is an element of, of Zionism, as I understand it. Uh, so, so it would be very strange for me to, to call myself a Zionist. Uh, I, do, I, should, I support the Jewish state in principle. I, I support the, the, uh, the idea of Jews having uh, a state and specifically in their historic home, homeland. And I think that they have a moral claim according to um, commonly accepted moral principles to that that land so 
if that's what Zionism means, then then I guess so. But do you think that, do you think the Jews have any more moral claim to that land than the Arabs who, let's say, we, we'll talk about the Arabs who lived there for say hundreds of years in that geographic area that's now the Jewish state of Israel. Um. So. I think that common, according to common common sense or commonly accepted moral principles, uh, Jews have a very strong claim to that land. They were forced out. They never gave up uh, their claim to ownership for uh, 1,800 years. Uh, they pray three times a day facing that piece of land wherever they are. Uh, they, uh, they pray uh, every day to return to the, to the land. So um, there is an idea in uh, certain legal systems that if you give up some property and somebody else acquires it, or, or a piece of land that they that the new owner, the new occupant, has rights over the land. But that doesn't apply if you continually protest. So if they forcibly take something from you and you protest and you protest and you protest, you protest. Uh, as far as I know, there's no legal or moral system which says that they they acquire it no matter how much time passes that they would be able to acquire it. If they're forcibly um, occupying it against your protest, and I don't think that it would be a reasonable principle to say that people are allowed to steal anything they want and then um, even though you, you continue protesting, if enough time passes, then they would be able to um, to be the rightful legal owner. This is a, a bit complicated in, in the case of um, Jews versus Arabs because in terms of uh, uh, like genetic similarity to uh, the, the ancient Israelites, it's quite likely that the Palestinians share more genetic code um, than, say, Ashkenazim with the, and even possibly by descent as well. Uh, many Arabs in that, in that region are presumably descended from, uh, from Jews, but Jews who gave up being Jewish and who only um, survived by adopting a different religion and um, essentially giving up the, the claim that their ancestors had made to the land. So I mean, it, that that is kind of a, I think that that does introduce an element of complexity into the moral uh, analysis, but uh, I think the Jews have a strong claim. I don't deny that Arabs also have a claim. I'm not saying that there's no claim whatsoever to having lived somewhere for, for centuries. They're not the ones who stole the land. They're not the Romans or who, uh, who kicked the Jews out in, uh, um, in the second century. So so that's not their fault, and now they're being punished for this. If they're if the Arabs are now expelled, they're being punished for a crime committed a long time ago by by different people. So that also is something that would have to be considered. So now I don't think that common sense morality would dictate that Jews should just come and 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 kick everyone out. Uh, but I think. The claim that Jews have needs to be weighed against 
um, the claims of others. And, and do the, the claims of Arabs whose ancestors lived in the land that is now the Jewish state of Israel and whose uh, parents and grandparents were, let's just to make the example more dramatic, were, say, forcibly expelled from what is now Israel, do they not have a very strong claim to the land as well? Well, they have a claim. Jews have a claim. So, and uh, then Jews collectively may also have a claim to a, a Jewish state. Um, and that claim then could be violated by uh, bringing in large numbers of non Jews. So, you know, there's no objective answer to 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 how these these questions should be decided, or which claim you judge to be uh, stronger. But right. you know, the the vast majority of Israelis are willing to accept living on a small fraction of what was their original homeland uh, in exchange for peace. Um, now, th there are obviously uh, Zionists who want everything, and uh, but if there were a real prospect of peace, uh, Israelis would definitely get those people under control and they would not be sitting at the border with the Arab countries, uh, you know, firing rockets at them and, uh, and trying to massacre their civilians. So um, the a compromise that would respect the claims of, of everyone to some degree would be uh, would include a, a Jewish state that is smaller than, much smaller than the original mandate for Palestine and their original um, homeland of Eretz Israel. Do you have a more intense Jewish identity now as a result of the October 7 attacks? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, uh, because it's not, uh, I always have cared about the, um, the existence of Israel. I think it's a good thing to, uh, to have the Jewish state and I have some connection being with that being Jewish myself. Uh, so I'm paying more attention to it now that we're, uh, the Jewish state is under threat in a way that it uh, uh, hasn't been for a long time. And I think the prospect of another extermination of Jews uh, while not, not likely, is at least conceivable in a way that it wasn't um, just a few weeks ago. And I would uh, be interested in preventing that. Uh, so obsessive is a very common put down used against people who have more interest in a particular topic than the descriptor thinks is uh, appropriate. Uh, what's an adaptive and appropriate level of uh, interest in Jews and the Jewish state for, say, non-Jews? Well, that depends what their goal is. If their goal is to um, get a lot of Twitter followers or um, start a um, kind of uh, fringe dissident movement, 
then being openly anti-Semitic is a, is a very good idea because that would that would advance the goal. Uh, if they want to um, uh, get status among the mainstream left, then they can focus on Israel and why Israel is bad. Now, but then for the average person, like, will the average person's life become better by killing Jews or killing all the Jews in Israel or getting rid of Israel? Then no, clearly not at all. The world will become a worse place if, for, the, for, for the vast majority of people. Possibly even for many of the Palestinians themselves, if uh, um, Hamas or, or something like Hamas um, is allowed to establish a state on the ashes of Israel, um, the lot of the average Palestinian could well become uh, much worse. Um, although maybe they would prefer to be terrorized by by someone who looks like them rather than somebody who looks slightly different and who is Jewish. Um, because maybe that's that's human nature. But uh, yeah, I'm, a lot of a lot of this stuff I think is irrational to the extent that it's motivated by either false beliefs about about Israel or false beliefs about the wonderful benefits that would come from from getting rid of Israel. We hear a lot about anti-Semitism. Is there such a thing as anti-Gentilism among Jews? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, why not? I mean, in, in this respect, I don't think there's a big difference between Jews and Gentiles. Um, I mean, Jews um, there are many Jews who quit being Jewish and then join the pogromists. And there are many Jews who support um, the most vicious genocidal anti-Israelism. And within the Jewish community, um, um, I mean, Gentiles have a, um, there can be anti-Gentile attitudes that are just rooted in bigotry. I mean, the same reason that uh, Gentiles are, look for other people to blame, Jews would blame Gentiles. And it feels some people are going to feel good when they hate others. So there, there are certainly Jews like that. So you have a tweet that Jews have some responsibility for the diversity golem that is beginning to turn on them. Is there any significant difference between, say, Jew Jewish attitudes to diversity and political correctness and, say, uh, WASP attitudes towards diversity? I mean, I, I think when you account for levels of secular education and or IQ, there don't seem to be many differences in political attitudes between wasps and, and Jews. Yeah, well, there was wasp, uh, wasp self-hatred was uh, a very much a thing that developed without Jewish influence. Um, wasps, there, there was a, a generation of wasp intellectuals who decided that wasps are boring, everybody else is is uh, more more exciting and and, uh, and we need more non wasps and it's an embarrassing to be wasp then jews also kind of jumped on this bandwagon and, and they continue and they they help promote these ideas obviously um, but the a lot of the uh, uh, the Jewish support for diversity was rooted in a similar kind of self-hatred 
uh, as it was in wasps, which is this is against the, the, you know, the McDonald narr narrative. Uh, it was a plan to advance Jewish interests. I, I mean, obviously, there were some Jews who thought that um, one of the benefits of this movement would be that there wouldn't be there, there would be less anti-Semitism, uh, but for and for the most part, Jews have identified as white, and Jewish liberals see themselves as among the bad guys. But they didn't anticipate. And they just didn't take non-whites seriously. I think they thought that they would they would always be under the control of the white liberal intellectual class, um, and you know they could have some Black Panther kind of groups, but that was just kind of cute acting out. Not something that they took really seriously. And yes, this is the golem that now is turning on them. So supporters of Israel have often decried Palestinians not trying to achieve their means through peaceful means. And then Palestinians and their supporters develop BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction which is a nonviolent way of promoting the, the Palestinian agenda. So do you see BDS as a, you know, a legitimate tool, or do you think BDS is something that needs to be opposed? I mean, so I, I disagree with, with the end, obviously, and... Uh, you know, engaging in, if we're going to have norms of uh, political discourse and negotiation, having people gang up on the, uh, on the group that you don't like to deprive them of uh, basic material needs is, uh, very questionable um, that we want to live in a world where people act like that. So generally, we agree not to do that kind of thing. Uh, it's like um, you know taking away the the credit cards of the bank accounts of racists. Um, even though in many cases I probably disagree with the people whose bank accounts were were taken away, uh, I don't agree with that tactic because um, we should try to create conditions where we can resolve resolve things in a, uh, in a peaceful rational way um, and BDS basically an act of war so then I guess we would just we're not if uh, if it's a war, then there's no more negotiation and you just fight with all, all the means available. But that, that I think is not really desirable. But, but doesn't that then reveal that that was just empty posturing when supporters of Israel asked for, for Palestinians to develop nonviolent means of pursuing their cause, then Palestinians do exactly that. And you couldn't overstate the the opposition to BDS from pro-Israel sources. So does that not show that the the call by pro-Israel supporters for Palestinians to develop nonviolent uh, means of pursuing their goals, uh, that was just empty posturing? Well, I'm not familiar with those calls for Palestinians to adopt nonviolent means. So if the Palestinian goal is the destruction of the state of Israel, and you say adopt nonviolent means to achieve your goal, then that would be absurd because the goal could only be achieved through uh, through violence. So 
why would you say to adopt means that could never work to achieve your goal? If somebody said that, then that, yes, that would be just posturing. And uh, what about a, a one state solution where, you know, Arabs, Palestinians, Israelis, uh, Jews, uh, live together in one state that uh, will be demographically tipping Arab. Do you think that would be a humanitarian disaster or do you think that would be a moral improvement on the current situation? Well, there would just be uh, 15 million people murdering each other. I don't see how anyone could think that's desirable. Um, well, I guess Jews would, would probably be the losers in that scenario. I think the Arabs would kill more Jews in hand-to-hand in -hand combat. There would be more Arabs uh, coming in, and a lot of Jewish peaceniks wouldn't last that long. Um, so that would just be giving everything to the Arabs including the lives of all, all the Jews living in Israel is the most likely outcome. Are there any critics of the Jewish state of Israel who you accord respect? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, if you suggest some names, maybe I could, I could comment on them. I mean, I, I'd not, that interested in the day-to-day -day commentary about, you know, the, why why did Israel confiscate this well, and wh what was the principle, and the, was the the well was dug illegally, but did they have some reason why they dug the well? And that's a lot, a lot of like Israel commentaries about that kind of thing, um, which I see as kind of not very um, uh, closely related to the the core moral issue, which is what I'm interested in, which is who has a claim uh, to the land and in principle, should you have a right to defend yourself against the kind of aggression that we've seen. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the most interesting um, challenge to Israel is the idea that the Palestinians really are the uh, the uh, indigenous people of this land, that they're descended, that uh, they have a closer connection to by descent to the Israelites than uh, other than Jewish populations, the people who identify as Jewish. So maybe that would be the only, one of the few uh, critiques of the, uh, the Israeli position that I think um, deserves to be thought about. Uh, but most you... of the stuff that, yeah. No, go yeah, ahead, finish your point. But most of the stuff that people say about Israel turns out to be very questionable or just made up in my experience. So do you have history with Israel? Have you visited? Have you spent much time there? I spent about a year in Israel. I studied at the yeshiva in Jerusalem. And how did that affect you? And how does that continue to affect you, if at all? I, uh, well, I, I learned about Judaism. Uh, I uh, I was motivated to sign up for my first philosophy course due to the influence of one of the rabbis there who had been a tenured professor of philosophy at Johns Hopkins University, uh, specializing in the philosophy of mathematics, but then became a Boston or Hasid. And and a rabbi, and he quit academia and not now teaches in the yeshiva. Very smart guy. Uh, and uh, 
I guess it was, you know, I grew up in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So I hadn't really met anyone with radically different views from everybody I knew. And everybody was basically some kind of liberal, uh, atheist. A lot of people went to Hebrew school, but of course that was just a joke. Uh, even the rabbis were atheists at the reformed temples. Now, I, when I went to, to Israel, my understanding of Judaism had, was based largely on personal study and I was, I was, uh, was very influenced by Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and that was my understanding of Judaism when I arrived in Israel. And then it was really a shock to discover how different um, authentic Judaism was from my, uh, my understanding. And the fact that people actually believed these things that are so different from what I believed and what anyone I knew believed. And that was a learning experience. I think a lot of liberals who, who spent their whole life in a liberal environment they think deep down everybody's a liberal, everybody is like them, and they don't have the imagination uh, to understand that some people really are different and they really have different and totally incompatible beliefs. And I was like that when I was 17, and, and then when I was 18, I went to Israel and I, um, I was able to, to recognize that, that bias and so that was valuable. Um, uh, to, to what extent, if at all, does your Jewish identity uh, blind you to objective reality of the Arab-Israeli conflict? I don't, when it comes to objective facts, I don't think I have any I don't see what the, the biases are. If somebody shows me evidence that Palestinians are more closely descended from Israel, uh, related to Israelites than, than I am or other Jewish groups, I don't, there's no, no resistance. I, that, that's very bad news for the, for the Zionist position that, that creates complexities, unwelcome complexities for the Zionist position. I have no problem accepting those, those things as soon as somebody suggests them, it presents evidence. Um, when Israel um, has uh, expelled Palestinians, the fact that Palestinians were expelled from Israel, which is an inconvenient fact, doesn't, no, no problem uh, for me to, to acknowledge that. So I, I don't know what, I, I can't, how can I say there's no bias? I, I just don't, I just don't see it. I don't have any reason to feel that I'm biased. Uh, the, I think the American news media and America as a nation and American discussions about Israel tend to lean much more in a pro-Israel direction than what happens in Europe. Have you noticed a difference? For example, I believe that Zionist is largely considered a dirty word in Europe. Uh, Zionist is not considered a dirty word in the United States. Yeah, I do sometimes watch clips of the BBC and Channel 4. And yeah, they're, they're definitely anti-Israel. Muslims have a lot more influence in the UK, and I assume uh, in Europe as well, than, than Jews do. Uh, so I, I, I suspect that um, uh, Muslims have the kind of influence in the UK that Jews have in America. That would be my impression. Uh, would you agree that uh, the American news media presents a, a pro-Israel slant uh, more often than not, and that uh, American politics is 
they're somewhat uh, influenced by the Israel lobby. Do you, do you agree that there is an Israel lobby in the U.S.? It, yeah, I'm not an expert on the mechanics of the Israel lobby. I mean, there are a lot of um, uh, so I can't comment on the details of that, but I, I know there there are a lot of interest groups that are pro-Israel in the United States for various reasons. Um, Christian support for Israel is certainly important. And um, I don't, my impression is that this level of pro-Israelism would not exist uh, if it weren't for the Christian evangelical uh, attitudes toward Israel. But I mean, of course, the, you know, politics is, is influenced by by lobbying groups on both sides. Uh, so, yeah. So it, it was surprising to me after 9-11 that there wasn't an upswell in anti-Israel sentiment, given that Osama bin Laden said one of the reasons he attacked the U.S. on 9-11 on was because of American support for Israel. Uh, plenty of people like uh, John Mearsheimer have, have made the, the case that American support for Israel is not good for America. Certainly seems to have played a role in precipitating 9-11 attacks. Now we've got President Joe Biden flying to Israel in a time of war, which is virtually unprecedented. I can't imagine any other major American politician doing something. We've got two major aircraft carriers moving through the, the Mediterranean closer to Israel, do you have any concerns that uh, the pro-Israel lobby has uh, been so effective that it has steered American policy against America's best interests? Well, first, I would um, question what America's interests are. What does that mean? And as far as I can tell, the interests of America just refers to the 